Um, thanks for inviting me. It's very exciting to be here. It's a really interesting symposium. It's um, not what we normally get involved in, so it's great. Um, so we, um, I'm going to present, I said I'd present some case studies. I think I'm just going to do one case study because I think it unpacks a lot of the issues that we find in um, Aboriginal design in remote communities. And I think by way of context, um, it's important to realise that when we talk about Aboriginal communities, we're not trying to make generalisations. Um, and so then looking at a specific community, I think is much more useful because we're talking about exactly what this community has told us as being their sort of really core criteria for their design and their facility. But um, I'll take you from the closed sealed box of air conditioning microclimates into the um, tropical, subtropical northwestern Australia um, to um, Gidja country, which is um, home of Pernalulu, which is one of the sort of um, national, well, the, one of the great treasures of the world in terms of the beehive domes um, and the community of Warman. Um, so, um, the Kimberley region of Western Australia is, um, is pretty diverse and I'm going to just talk a little bit about the realms of operation that we work within and it kind of unpacks one of the conditions of Australia that is probably not represented very much, largely because the population is actually very small and so um, Western Australia is always whinging about not getting enough GST because it's so spread out and therefore things like health delivery and education delivery and those kind of things are really stretched. And so maybe it's a kind of almost Ecuadorian situation. <laughs> um, so the Kimberley is that little coloured blob in the top right hand corner of that slide and there's a diverse language group running through the Kimberley region. Um, there's something like 43 individual Aboriginal languages being spoken in the Kimberley region. The po whole population has about 39,000 people and the population of Warman community is about 350. And there's probably around 500 speakers of the Gidja language in that area, maybe, maybe five, between 500 and 600 people. Um, and so this is a picture of the building I want to talk about, which is the Wollumba Elder Centre. And it looks south into the valley of Turkey Creek. Um, which uh, misbehaved um, in 2011. Um, one of the um, realms of operations that we work in is we like to think about the communities where we work with um, really in a lot of detail and talk to people and work with people. So we talk about the distinct na nations and the language groups in the mixed communities. We talk about um, this common commonalities between these communities. So in, and this is probably applies to the top half of Australia quite clear. Clearly it's the common history of colonisation. Um, there's a change in demographics in these communities, so there's actually a missing generation of people who are dying from um, particular health conditions. So for instance, we have this massive influx of renal disease which is killing um, Aboriginal men and women um, rapidly at the moment, so it's quite a hideous scenarios and statistics that you look at. And then there's these traditional cultural practices and traditional law which comes into our design and how, do our, how does our normal institutional design of schools, of, of um, even a house can be institutional when you're dealing with public housing, um, but hospital facilities, how does, how does that interact with, the, with how people want to live? Um, and then there's this problem of generational institutional poverty, of, of ongoing problems with parents who have al alcoholism, whose parents had alcoholism, and how that poverty translates down to the children and the generations of today, which is not really overcome by architecture, but certainly architecture can assist in the decline through bad decision making. Um, and those social consequences, which is really that kind of classic post-colonial sort of event, sort of scenario that we're in, I kind of, and I don't know if I'm allowed to do this, but I kind of call it a fourth world community where we have this third world conditions embedded in a first world community, which should be a great shame, you know, and I mean shame from a perspective of citizens of this country, you know, it's, it's sort of outrageous. And um, the World Health Organization and others have pointed to Australia as being very sort of poor in its response to Aboriginal people. This is an image of the smoking ceremony of the, um, of the facility, and I've got a little film at the end of this. If we've got time, I'll play some of that. I just want to touch on the other topologies. There's obviously housing, which is both community and staff housing, which is really important in these communities and towns. The support services of office, workshops, depots and recreation, institutional buildings, health clinics, hospitals, aged care, justice, police stations, courts and prisons, um, the schools, hybrid buildings, which are kind of these weird things. So we've been designing renal hostels, which are non-health based facilities, but they're for Aboriginal people in renal dialysis who would, who would otherwise have to move to a major city to get their dialysis, so it allows them to live close to new dialysis chairs which are being built around Western Australia. And then there's short-stay 
accommodation for people in towns and there's even very short stay which is camps, so outstation communities and camps around towns. Um, that's actually Kananara Courthouse which is a very, the court is a very institutional um, facility and this is actually, we've designed this one with TAG architects and the Merrill and Gadgerong people were instrumental in the design of that space and the foyer spaces in the courthouse for instance and West Kimberley Regional Prison which is the world's first culturally sustainable prison which was, whose brief was developed by elders in the West Kimberley uh, PDU who's a um, a Yaru man and June Oscar, who's a Bunaba elder, they developed a brief for this facility and then we master planned it and managed to win the um, collaboration with TAG Architects to actually build it and, and complete the construction of the project. Um, and it's been very successful. So this is a utopian Aboriginal community that happens be, to be behind a maximum security fence that has men and women living separately. But the idea is that the, um, the men and women living here can get good um, social outcomes from their time in prison. Um, so Warman, we'll take you to Warman. So um, there's a great article in The Monthly in 2012 which is available online called Knock 'em Down Rains by Sophie Cunningham which talks a lot about the flood in Warman and it's definitely worth a read. read. And Warman's a painting community so um, the Musée Key de Branley has a beautiful um, mural that's put on the roof of it by um, Lena Narabai. Um, so it's a really strong art-based community. Um, Rover Thomas um, is a very famous Aboriginal, one of the first major Aboriginal painters who came out of, um, actually came out of Well 33 Kunawaraji and ended up in Mormon. And his wife Queenie McKenzie um, lived here. Um, and this is a painting of Queenie of the Great Flood of Texas Downs in 1922 and the ration station on the right hand side from the 50s uh, telling us that the, the area floods and lo and behold in 2011 a catastrophic flood took out the whole of the community. So the whole community went underwater. It was completely wiped out and they had to rebuild the community in about 12 months. Um, people were evacuated to Kununurra and to Halls Creek um, and the elders of the aged care centre um, were moved in those places. Half of them interestingly died during that 12 months of being taken away from their country. Um, these are the images of the floods. And the building sits, the, the community said to us, we want this aged care centre to be at the heart of the community. It's really important. They, and they don't describe it as an aged care centre, they describe it as an elder centre. And that's because they wanted to have the elders close to the school and the kids, so the elders who are becoming really frail can communicate their law and cultural practices to the young people in the community. So it was right in the heart of the community next to the school. Um, and then surrounding these hills which have cultural significance, there's creation stories about the hook, the, the, the um, the, the place and there's also a, a tree which is here which has a, you can see that white dot, that's actually a 600 litre refrigerator stuck in the top of the tree which is kind of a memorial from the flood which um, this wing of the building, um, there's a little Juliet balcony there that looks at that fridge which is retained, I think the fridge is empty now. Um, these are the kind of sketches we do and I was going to, we also use model making so we do a lot of sketching and a lot of model making when we sit down and try and develop the brief and the challenge in this project was to take the normal aged care brief which we had like for like funding to current standards so the community got a pretty nice building because the old one was hideous um, and the idea was to take this licensed aged care brief and to try and match it up with the community's desires and needs so we had to balance those requirements for licensed aged care with how the community wanted to use the building. It sits in a, what's called middle camp, which is a fairly rough part of town. And that's the plan of the building and, and kind of, the building sits up on legs because we're actually in the flood zone again. So we're three metres off the ground, which is a little unusual for aged care delivery. Um, so to get into the building, there's a vehicle access coming up a kind of a beachhead and the building sort of sits almost like a jetty or a bridge thrusting into the flood plain, which would come underneath the building through here. Um, and then there's stairs and um, ramps coming down to this common area in the middle, like a courtyard. This is actually the, the, um, the women's wing, and so these, these are women's rooms and they're standard sized aged care rooms, and these are outdoor veranda spaces. So for the Gidja people, they spoke to us about these outdoor spaces being the most important spaces for them to use. So we're talking about environmental indoor air quality. The air quality here is open air. It's, it's hideously hot in summer, like we can get up to 47, 48 degrees. We have bushfires, we have smoke, we have dust. It's extreme environments. In winter, it doesn't quite get a frost, but it, just about gets at about one degree at minimum temperatures. Um, this is the men's wing, so we have gender separation in this community. They really want men and women to have separate areas at this age. And then there's a common room here, which is a married couple's room. 
there's a palliative care room and then there's a respite care room. This is staff accommodation, this is the laundry facility with some public toilets, this is the offices, um, commercial kitchen, dining space, outdoor dining space and lots of veranda areas including a, um, a big fire pit here and there's fire pits down in this area. So it's a very simple building, it's a very simple layout and it's very small, it's only got about you know, you could fit maybe 20 people in there if you really pushed it. Um, the, the rooms are quite large, people wanted to share rooms. So that's that diagram about the separate areas for men and women. And the, the core reason, one of the core reasons for separating men and women is this, this idea of cultural practices. So these areas here and here are screened from view and it allows the men and women to actually take younger people in the community and get them their cultural transmissions for their law and culture knowledge. And that really allows, so these, these people are so frail that they can't go into bush to do these practices normally, they'd have to do it in the centre. And so that's, um, thank you, I'll be quick. <laughs> um, so that's why these two areas are separate, they're screened from view. There's this idea of cultural surveillance as well. Aboriginal people, in, 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 usually across the Kimberley, like to see um, their relations and their, um, their family members moving across the community and through the community. And to a certain degree, that's part of their um, kinship system. So the, everyone in the community has a skin group, or, a, or, or a, um, and that skin group defines their relationship with everyone in the community. People will be their mother, brother, or they'll have an avoidance relationship. So a son-in-law, mother-in-law relationship. Son-in-law to some mother-in-laws aren't allowed to meet or face each other or to talk to each other, so these paths of travel through the facility allow people to have different movements to avoid each other if they need to do that from a cultural perspective. They also allow a respite, so people are, everyone has their own little balcony, so if they don't want to be in the communal areas, they can have their own little private balcony to get away from pieces, places and people. There's view corridors into the landscape and out between the breezeways, and these are the images of the building. So um, this is the classic nice pretty architectural images and then there's the kind of realities of how the building's being used so the, the kids have well colonized the building um, uh, yeah so um, again the building kicks up to the landscape and frames views of these hills this is the beginning of the smoking ceremony where snappy gums are being cut and brought into the into the building um, we've planted in the landscape we've actually collected bush taka and, bu and bush plants including those snappy gums and grown them around the landscaping so people can actually get the smoking um, plants and, and harvest them around the building, they don't have to go away to do it. The building has to be fenced in, it's an aged care centre and there's quite a lot of humbug, which is when kids come in and they try and steal money or people want to get food and stuff like that, so it has to have a degree of control over it, that's the fireplace. That's the fireplace in action, so we're firing it up to cook some um, kangaroo um, and some barnies, which are racehorse governors, and so we're just alternating these views of people using the building. The building's roofs actually, we've been naughty and we've kind of undulated them and created a landscape of these box gutters that create kind of rain events during um, big storms, so it kind of almost forms its own landform. There's, there's a quite a well done kangaroo. Um, and this is images of the rain and the kids playing under these beautiful, um, these waterfalls that are created. And this notion of bringing the kids to the site, very early on they were saying we want the elders to sit there and see the kids playing around the building. So we articulated that by saying, well, let's just put these box gutters in and create these rain events. And every time it rains, the kids swarm over there and they dance under these waterfalls. This is one of the views from the respite um, care, the palliative care room, so people get a bit of break away. And that's actually the end of that Juliet balcony is the fridge, but you can't see that photograph. This is the men's activity area. For, you can see how it's screened from view. Um, moving along the men's wing to the end, this is a women's activity area looking out into the landscape. These are just images from the smoking day. So the underside of this in this land, this landscape is now huge, it's just grown up and it's, I unfortunately don't have good photos of it. Um, but those collars, the, these concrete um, discs are, allow people to light fires and stuff, although people will light fires wherever they need to, but that was used in the smoking ceremony, as you can see. So this is the idea of trying to create care and delight in a building and to try and make those spaces really work for the people that are in them, to try and model air movement through the spaces, to capture breezes and to protect people from the sun. The building in a way is a kind of a big hat with these little spaces inside it. Dual paths of travel so men and women can come out of the separate sections if they need to to the ground. We tried to keep the trees on the site as much as we could. And then there's this um, little, um, I'll just click through this thing because I know I've run out of time. Um, I'll just see if I can get you some waterfall 
action. So there's some waterfall action for you. <laughs> I haven't got the kids playing under that one. Is that too late? And then I'll just take you, there's a little, I'll just take you to the beginning of the smoking ceremony. So I'm allowed to use these images, I've got permission to show this smoking ceremony, but it's um, really people using the building and, and enjoying it. And for, for the Gidget community, it's really important that the building is smoked. Um, and that smoking ceremony protects people from the bad spirits. Interesting for fire, for fire control panels and that kind of stuff to be able to have isolation from these things. The smoking ceremony was taken around the building in a bucket for all the rooms, so every room was smoked. So I can mute that mic and then, with due respect to the elders, I'll mute it. Mute it. Maybe I'll mute it here. No? You know, I'll just, I'll just stop, I'll stop there. I was muting my mic. Yeah, I think it is. So I'll just stop it here. There you go, I have to stop it because I can't mute it. It wants to sing, so. Yeah. This country, country wants to sing. <laughs> <laughs> so, <of course. laughs>